And joining us now on the debate, in Vancouver, B.C., Barbara Yaffe of the Vancouver Sun, in Ottawa, Almas Bawar of the Senless Council, and Steve Staples of the Rideau Institute. And with us here in studio, Brian McDonald of the Conference of Defense Associations and Jeffrey Kopstein from the University of Toronto. Glad to have everybody alongside here in Toronto and in Points Beyond for our debate today. We are hearing, I think it's fair to say, Brian, I'll go to you first, very contradictory information about how well things are going over there. So why don't you start us off and we'll go around the horn. How well are things going over Well, there? they have <coughs> gone through the rotation from the RCR battle group to the Van Du battle group, which has gone smoothly. They have been attacked. They've lost three members of the battle group to improvised explosive devices. And the Taliban have made an attempt to bag a police post in Jari province, which the Canadians had cleared before. And this time the Van Dus went back in and retook the position and turfed the Taliban out. Uh, interestingly, <clears throat> with, this is the area of Ahmadusa of a year ago, uh, which was a really a heavy duty uh, fists up with the Taliban. This time, the Taliban simply appeared and then disappeared, the, the, being pushed by the, the Van Dus. Barbara Yaffe in Vancouver, what's your sense of how things are going? I have three main concerns with respect to our combat mission right now. One is that the, we are losing a disproportionate number of Canadian troops, and I think every Canadian really feels this in their heart. And as well, I don't think that we're discussing enough the situation with the poppies and the, uh, the opium um, that's coming out of there. It, it has to be part of this debate. One third of the Afghan economy is poppy based, according to the World Bank. So this is getting lost in, in the rhetoric. The third concern I have is that the political parties are trying to score points and this issue has become a political football so that the clarity is being muddied and we don't have a clear sense of where each political party stands and who we should be supporting. Steve Staples in Ottawa, your sense of how things are going? Well, like anything, Steve, I think there's some good news and some bad news. I think the bad news is, in terms of the war effort, it's, it's either a stalemate or I think we're, on, we're not winning. Uh, as Brian pointed out, we seem to be having to retake territory that had been taken in the past. Uh, we're getting hit by improvised explosive devices only hundreds of meters from our checkpoints, which we thought were, uh, were safe. And as, as Barbara mentioned, you know, the elephant of the room is the poppy crop, which has uh, hit, uh, hit record highs. That's the bad news. The good news, I hope, is, is we've seen in the newspapers today that there may be some movement, that we might be able to make some progress on a diplomatic settlement. And I think uh, Stephen Harper, I hope, is beginning to rethink his position. Uh, on, on this mission, and so those are some good signs. Almas, let me pass it right over to you, sitting right beside Steve. Pick up the torch and tell us what you think. I think uh, the security situation in Kandahar is getting worse day by day. Uh, there is no good news. Uh, there is no development work. Uh, people are starving. Uh, Taliban are getting advantage of, of the grievousness of these people in recruiting them in their camps. Uh, eradication are putting Canadian troops and a danger in Kandahar. Jeff Kopstein. Well, the good news is, is that in a, in a broad part of the country, in the north and the west, things are actually relatively calm. The bad news is that Canada is taking it on the chin on a daily basis in, in, in the southern part of the country, in Kandahar. And which brings up the broader question, I agree with many of the things that Barbara brought up. Uh, one other question is the issue of burden sharing with our other allies. Is Canada, is Canada going to be one of the only countries that actually is at the sharp end of all of this? Look, let's put Go this ahead, in, Barbara. Look, let's put this in perspective. NATO has, thir uh, has 26 member countries. We have a disproportionate share of troops there. We're, we have, we're contributing 6% of all the troops. And NATO isn't the only uh, institution that's, that's fighting this thing. There are other countries. I think it's a total of 35 or 36 countries that are over there. We are losing. We've lost 70 soldiers so far. It's way out of proportion to our numbers. Therefore, I believe that the Liberal Party is putting for, forward a very practical position in saying that, OK, we will have shed our share of blood by February 2009, which is when our current commitment in Kandahar ends, let another country come in and take over, and we will go somewhere else in Afghanistan. We won't cut and run. We'll go and we'll do humanitarian work in another province where our casualty figures won't be so high. Ryan, is that an option? 
Well, it depends on whether or not you have somebody who's prepared to step in and take up the replacement position. Doesn't if you appear have, to be at the moment. If you have, then things can be viewed, I think, fairly comfortably. If you don't have that person or that country willing to step in, then that hole that is created by pulling out of Kandahar, handing it effectively back to the Taliban, destroys the position of the Brits in Helman province next door, destroys the position of the Dutch and the uh, Australians in Uruzgan to the north, and really then makes the whole contribution we made to this point seem not very worthwhile. Steve Staples, would you agree that if there's nobody to pick up the torch from the Canadian troops, they can't leave yet? Would you agree with that? Well, I think the government is trying to build up the Afghan National Army and the other security forces as a viable replacement. I think they've come to the conclusion, quite rightly, that there is going to be no cavalry coming from NATO. I've, I've spoken to members of governments from other NATO countries, the Germans in particular, are quite proud of the accomplishments that they've made in the north and they fear that if they move their troops out that that those areas and any aid and development that they've made could slip backwards but but let's let's remind ourselves that uh, that's assuming that the conditions on the ground carry on as they are right now we could change the chessboard to a degree if we're able to get some kind of negotiation going, if you get some kind of diplomatic process and guarantees in place there, then that's worth untold numbers of troops. You don't need those troops anymore because you're putting a, a diplomatic and a peace process uh, in place to improve the security situation, and I think that's, that's the way to go. Jeff Kopstein, how about that? Well, it, it would be the way to go under one condition as long as this kind of negotiation would not simply be a backhanded way of handing the country back to the Taliban. Because if, that's really, if this is really Vietnam all over again, nego negotiating with Hanoi until the Americans pull out with the last guy hanging from the helicopter, if that's the situation that we're going to be in, then in fact, after all of this, and this is really a question that I have for all of us, are we then back to right, pre-9-11 Afghanistan? And then what is this all about then? Is it, did we, will we not leave the world in a much more dangerous situation than, than before we entered Afghanistan? I think we all woke up this morning and saw some very fine reporting by Graham Smith on the front page of the Globe and Mail today. And the headline is, What the Increasingly Confident Taliban Want in Exchange for Peace. And he's done some very good reporting here, suggesting um, that uh, the Taliban are not going away. They are increasingly confident, and we're going to have to deal with them whether we like it or not. Now, let's read something actually can I read this as well here's something quoted from the piece Michael let's bring this up if they want to talk this is a Taliban spokesperson if they want to talk we have two demands all foreign troops must leave and we must have an Islamic democracy in Afghanistan Almas, how should we respond to that uh, I think we have to define who Taliban's are at first and then we can decide uh, on negotiation there are two kinds of insurgents in, in Afghanistan one are fundamental fighters, foreign fighters, and there are uh, local fighters who are recruited by these uh, uh, Al-Qaeda members uh, from refugee camps or uh, because uh, they lost their uh, family members, uh, because their crops were eradicated, they're angry with uh, Karzai's government or international community, and they're really, really easy to recruit in those camps. I think we can negotiate and we can win those people back and, and weaken uh, the, the Al Qaeda line, but it will be uh, it, it's impossible to negotiate with the hardline Al Qaeda members. Brian, how about it? All foreign troops must leave and we must have an Islamic democracy in Afghanistan. Either of those two things palatable for NATO? Well, I don't see any problem with, with the Islamic democracy because we already have the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, which has had an elected parliament and an elected president. So if their concept of an Islamic democracy is similar to the situation that is now in place, pretty, then I have no disagreement whatsoever. I'm pretty sure that's not what it now, means. Now, if we are proposing to withdraw all of the foreign troops, then, of course, at that point, the security problem goes back to the, the <coughs> Afghan National Army, which at this point is just beginning to start to move up the capability curve. We've got a, a good Kandak in Kandahar working with the Canadians. There's another one coming onto the ground, not up to its uh, capabilities yet. Another three in the pipe. But even when these are deployed, that's still, if they are left alone, they have no artillery, they have no air support, they have no logistics, they have no communications. And at that point, of course, you then achieve the Taliban objective, which is to take over the country because there is no ability on the part of the indigenous forces to resist. No, Steve, I think you have Sorry. to listen. Go ahead, Steve. Well, you have to listen carefully there. And, and if you read the article even further, 
they're not saying we want a Taliban government. They're saying we want an Islamic government. As Brian points out, that is essentially what they have now under the Karzai government. So they could be willing to accept and be brought into the Karzai government. And this would correct a mistake that was made by Western forces back in 2001 when they did the Bonn Agreement, wrote the Constitution for the country, but excluded the South, excluded the Taliban and all these other groups. And instead, what we effectively did was come in on one side of a civil war and got wrapped up in it. So we could correct that problem, bring in elements of the South, and I agree with uh, Albus, there will probably be some you know, hard line elements that we may, may not be able to completely negotiate with, but any smart military or political strategy you divide your opponents. You find wedge issues that you can do that. So if we can find elements that we can negotiate with under certain terms and pull them over to accept the legitimacy of the Karzai government, then we may not have to keep fighting this insurgent war like we have been. And I think that would really put the country back on a more secure footing and we can get that development okay, and Jeff aid Kopstein going. wants in here. Well, I mean, I think, the, I, I think the, the, the dichotomy between fighting or negotiating is a false one in an insurgency, and I think that's what many of us are getting at here. In fact, when you look at most insurgencies, the way they end, right, is the way they actually end is with a negotiation in the face of a very strong military presence. And the biggest, the structural problem in Afghanistan is that there's just not enough boots on the ground. And that's not, I'm not saying that Canada needs to put in more, but if, the, if you want to solve the problem with a big military presence, there needs to be more boots on the ground, just one number. In order to keep pacify Kosovo, right, just keep Kosovo the way it is, you have one soldier for every 55 citizens. The equivalent ratio in Afghanistan is one soldier for every 1,000 citizens. Not enough, you're right? saying. Not even close to enough. So if you want to get to that negotiating table, You've at least got to present the, the Taliban or the, the insurgents but, with a, cred, a credible alternative, and that alternative is a fight that won't stop. And the idea that we're simply going to say, oh, let's negotiate, and this is going to end, I think that's a bit silly. Barbara? There's a military dimension to this, certainly, and there's a negotiating slash diplomatic dimension to this. But none of this is going to make any difference unless we address the economic dimension of this issue. And the person who's best able to speak to this is the representative from the Senlis Council, who has done, so, the Senlis Council has done so much research in Afghanistan, and unless we, people have enough to eat, unless they can feed their families, and again, a third of the Afghan economy is pop, illegal poppy production, unless you address that through perhaps a Canadian pilot project to oversee the production of, of poppies for uh, production of morphine that can be exported to a market, a global market that's very needy, unless we address that, all this talk about the Taliban and, and the government and the fighting, is it's useless. Almost let me get you to comment on something that Arthur Kent, the former a broadcast journalist wrote in Policy Options of July, August 2007. He said, the Harper government has allowed itself to become trapped into providing public relations cover for a Kabul regime that is desperately in need of a complete overhaul. The sense that reconstruction is impossible, security is impossible, because in essence, you've got a Karzai government that's broken. Almost, do you agree with that? I, I think the Karzai government is a Kabul government at the moment. Uh, he doesn't have a support in, in rural areas, uh, in, in Kandahar or in Helmand, in, in uh, all over South. Uh, we need to win the hearts and minds of the local people. Without those people, we will not be able to win this war. This war cannot be won on the battlefield alone. We need Afghans to stand beside us, not beside Taliban. And how do we do that? Those guys, we, we eradicate their crops. Uh, they don't have alternative crops. Uh, there are no clinics, uh, no work, and Taliban's are offering them money to fight for them. The Sinless Council has proposed uh, a puppy for medicine project uh, to license farmers to grow puppy for the production of medicine, which is needed in the world. And I think Harper's government should support this. Brian, as you well, as you know, uh, Karzai is quote unquote our guy. However, Arthur Kent also has reported on a portrait of a government that's consumed by scandal and corruption and that essentially is dysfunctional. Is he right? Well, certainly in the Ministry of the Security Services, which has, has uh, the responsibility for the Afghan National Police, there's no question whatsoever. All of the commentators have pointed out 
the weakness of that, the corruption that is endemic through that. And until that is solved, then it's going to be a very difficult task to do things effectively. But the other dimension is sheer economics. The Karzai government, through its own natural resources of taxation and fees and such, has about $300 million a year that it can actually then use to provide government programs. The Taliban, on the other hand, the drug lords, with a, a market value of something in the order of three and a half billion dollars, of which about 750 stays with the farmers and the rest goes into the hands of the drug lords, the disproportion in the economic power of the drug lords on the one side and the government on the other side is a clear example of what the problems that the Karzai government actually faces. Steve, can I get you to follow up on this issue of the hearts and minds? How well do you think Western troops are doing right now trying to capture the hearts and minds of locals in Afghanistan? Well, uh, of course, the Senate Council folks have more data than, this, uh, than I do, but my sense is in some parts of the country uh, where uh, a peace agreement was put in, in the north, uh, from the Bonn Agreement, where development is occurring, uh, I think the Karzai government probably has much greater secure, uh, legitimacy uh, than it does in the south. But the insurgency is really, I think, uh, preventing uh, that kind of aid and development. At least, you know, we hear reams of stats from the Canadian government about all this money that's being spent. But, but the evidence on the ground, and at least what people think on the ground in Kandahar, is that they don't see it. So we've got to get some kind of security uh, situation there so we can get the aid in. But the problem is, uh, if we keep fighting this uh, counterinsurgency uh, war that we're doing with these kinds of search and destroy type missions that we're engaged in, and we keep displacing all these people from Panjway, as we've been hearing, and all these other districts, we're going to lose that battle for hearts and minds. And frankly, the, the Canadian government's position on negotiations, I mean, they've got to get with the program because Maxime Bernier is saying you don't talk to terrorists, and I think that's really unhelpful, and we know that negotiations will be coming, and with this kind of attitude, Canada is just going to get uh, left uh, left out of the process will have no influence and, and, and at worst we could just end up prolonging the war because we were preventing this from moving well, forward. Let me follow up on that with Barbara. I, I believe there's only one party in the parliament of this country today that is advocating sitting down at a negotiating table with the Taliban and that's the NDP under Jack Layton. Do you support that idea? Uh, it, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, I think Jack Layton's point is to get the troops out of Afghanistan. That's Indeed. His, that's been his major position. He wants them out and he wants humanitarian work done. Obviously, uh, ultimately, we will never really achieve success without um, speaking with elements of the Taliban. And I think one of the other commentators has said you have to separate the, who are the reasonable Taliban that you can negotiate with and who are the ones that, that you can't, which is a very difficult task. But my concern is that the debate in Parliament, uh, which is going to resume in October, it's going to be dominated by the Afghan issue, and the, the, the whole debate is being muddied by partisanship. You know, Stephen Harper calling Stephen Dion pro-Taliban is really not helpful for Canadians. And I think Canadians need to know what's at stake here. Not only have we lost 70 soldiers, but CETA is spending $1.2 billion over there by 2011. And uh, the Afghan mission itself, as of 2009, will have cost Canadian taxpayers $4.3 billion. So I come back to the fact that Canada is just putting too much, it, Canada cannot assume the default position. We are one player of many. And I, I just don't think we can do it all. Okay. Now, one of the things that may be contributing to the Canadian public's unsureness about this whole topic is that it was, in fact, the Liberal government of Paul Martin that sent these troops over there in the first place. The Liberal Party does appear to be split somewhat on the issue of whether to keep the troops there. The Conservative Party doesn't be, seem to be too split at all. Neither does the Bloc and neither do the NDP. But let's show these numbers here from Ipsos Can West Global Television's poll of March 2006. So this is more than a year and a half ago right now. Where were the Canadian public on this mission? 52% supported the mission, 48% opposed the mission. So you have narrow favor. How about from August 2007, just about now? Support the mission, 51%, down one. Oppose the mission, 45%, down three. Brian, essentially, the numbers haven't moved in a year and a half. If you're a political leader in this country, trying to figure out where your public is at, what do you conclude? Well, uh, precisely, 
This is a country that is deeply divided on it, and you will find that there is movement back and forth a little tiny bit from month to month as the polls react to various events. But fundamentally, the division has not changed at all. And this then leads to some of the interesting sort of political conclusions. We seem to have a situation in which we have the Green Party, the NDP, the Bloc Québécois, and the Liberals all competing for the 50% that is opposed to the war, while leaving Stephen Harper all by himself with the one party going after the 50% that is in favor of the, of the mission. If you ask a different question, do you get different numbers? Absolutely. The two firms that have given the long-term series of polls that you can then see the whole development on are Strategic Council, which does polling for on behalf of Bell Global, uh, Bell, uh, CDB Global Media, Media, CDB Global Media and Ipsos Reid, which polls for CanWest Global. And you'll find that the question that is used by the Strategic Council polls basically says something like, do you support the decision to deploy the Canadians into the mission in Afghanistan? And that's the one that will give you, on average, about a 41% support level. The Ipsos Reid question is very different, and I'll paraphrase it. It says, do you approve of the use of the Canadian forces in combat roles against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda? And you'll get 51% support in that particular poll. So, so change the, 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 the question, and you change right. the numbers dramatically. And if you ask, are you in favor of Canadians participating in development in oh, Afghanistan? Oh, and development and, it goes up and another diplomacy, 10, 15 it points. goes way up after development, and the support comes up to around 90%. Steve, I wonder, though, in spite of what Brian is saying, is there something in the numbers that reflects to you, um, I don't know, a queasiness or an uneasiness among Canadians with this mission still? Well, it's certainly true that depending on how you ask the question, you, you do get these, these uh, strange different answers, and it's highly divisive. But what I look for in these polls is what they call directed opinion. Uh, you, usually the pollsters give uh, four options. Are you strongly in favor, sort of in favor, sort of opposed, and strongly, oppo strongly opposed? If you look at the directed, the strongly, uh, f you know, the strongly felt feelings, only about 10% uh, are strongly in favor of it, and about three times as many people are strongly opposed to it. And that, interestingly, is, according to Strategic Council, lines up with conservative support. So it seems that actually the conservatives have been using the war to rally their own support base. But I think they've also concluded that uh, they need to grow if they want to get a majority uh, uh, next in the next election. Uh, particularly, they're going to need Quebec. And this mission is weighing them down in so many different ways that they're not, it could prevent them from making any gains. That is true, Jeffrey. The numbers are certainly weakest in Quebec. Everybody right. knows that. However, a liberal government supported this mission once upon a time. A conservative government now supports this mission. Um, and yet there is an uneasiness among Canadians about this. Right. You look at the numbers and what, do you, what, what jumps out at you? Well, what, what really jumps out at me is that I think it, not only is the Canadian public split, but I think individuals are split in, in themselves. And I think it's interesting the kind of question you ask. I think people are really divided about how they feel about this. And the reason why is because on the one hand, they see that this is an extremely important mission. This is a kind of a global public good. Right? not letting the Taliban back in power, because the kind of thing that happened in 9-11 could really happen anywhere in the world. On the other hand, this is a guerrilla war, and it doesn't appear that there's any easy end to it. Right? Where is the end to all of this? We don't, we're, we're not going to be, the war is not going to end with uh, the Taliban capitulating on the, on the deck of an aircraft carrier like at the end of World War II. That's not going to happen. But if that's not going to happen, what's the way out? And where does, Canada, where does Canada's contribution need to end? And Barbara brought up, I think it's an extremely important point. I think it's important that um, the Canadian government, if they wish to have credibility vis-a-vis -vis their own people on this, that they have to start pushing their allies much harder than they are. The Globe and Mail had an interesting um, op-ed on this the other day where the Germans said to Canada, what a great job you're doing. We're so happy you're doing it. And the Globe and Mail said, yeah, w w we, we admire the admiration, but what we really <laughs> think you should do switch places with us for a while. Well, you talked to some German officials recently about this, right? What did yes. they tell you? Well, it's interesting. On the one hand, um, this is quite high German officials, and they said, well, and I, I said, well, why don't we switch places? And they said, well, the pro we have two problems. One is that we have a drafted army. That is to say, you can't bring home body bags because they're not volunteers. Number two, we're Germans. We can't be seen to be killing anyone. Well, then I would ask, well, OK, so what are you actually doing there? Well, they said, well, we're sharing the burden. Well, you say, well, why should we be the only ones to be, to be doing this? 
And they'd say, well, you're not the only ones. They're also the Dutch, the Americans, and the British. And he said, but this is always the same usual suspects. What they really view themselves as doing right, is involved in police activity and, and development activity. But even the police activity isn't really working very well. Just yesterday, the head of the EU police delegation, which is supposed to train the Afghan police, he's a German, he went home. He was fed up. The, for the entire country of Afghanistan, they have 200 people in there training police. It's just not enough. So as the general said here, when, um, when, we, take, when we take a village right, and, and then the, the Canadians leave, the Afghan police aren't really up to the job to make sure that the Taliban are, don't return. And so this is a huge issue. And the, the, the Canadian government really does need to step up and start putting pressure on our allies, or else I think there's going to be a lot of sniping from the sidelines. I'm delighted that he's um, increased your rank, but I think you're a colonel, aren't you? Actually, a colonel, yes. Colonel. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that. Can I, can I Go make ahead, a Barbara. comment on the, on the public opinion aspect and the polling data? It's true that the data have been pretty consistent over time, but I think you are going to start seeing now more fluidity coming into the situation, especially when Parliament reconvenes. And I think evidence of that is, um, is going, to, it's going to occur because people are going to start making the distinction between Canadians being over in Afghanistan in a support role or Canadians being over in Afghanistan in a combat role, which is what they are now. That distinction is becoming clear and public opinion is going to shift as a result. Also, the numbers of casualties are going up. And I think Harper knows that public opinion is on the cusp of, of shifting. Because if you've noticed, in the last month or so, he started saying different things about Afghanistan, about not continuing there in the combat mission unless the opposition parties vote. And he keeps changing his story, vote to support. Um, he keeps shifting. And I think that this is because he knows that Canadians are starting to feel a little queasy about this, and increasingly so. Almost, do you think that there would be more support for the mission in this country if other countries in NATO uh, pulled up their socks, as it were, and participated uh, more according to their numbers? Uh, Everybody has been saying it, and it's quite true. Canada is dramatically overrepresented over there right now, and other countries are really underrepresented right now. I think there are less troops in Kandahar, and that's why they call aerial bombing sometime when, when, and when troops are under attack. And that causes uh, civilian casualties and, again, increases support for the Taliban. I, I think other NATO countries need to contribute to southern Afghanistan, especially to Kandahar and Helmand, uh, to decrease uh, civilian casualties. Uh, on, on, the, on the Canadian side, uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Harper needs to tell the truth to Canadians. The, the Canadian mission shouldn't be about deadline. It should be about goal. What is Canada's goal in Afghanistan? And clarify that. There are two main uh, issues in, in, in southern Afghanistan that has to be addressed. Is One is puppy crop and uh, another is uh, poverty. Well, almost part of the goal is, of course, killing the enemy. Do you think Canada should be as involved in doing that as they are right now? Of course, if they are in southern Afghanistan and if they are under attack from from Taliban, of course they have to defend themselves. Uh, but to do that, they need the support of local people. They can't just do it by themselves. They can't win this war by themselves. And to do that again, you need to win the hearts and minds of those people. And and as as uh, I said before, we call on Prime Minister. Either he's supporting uh, uh, the puppy eradication led policy by U.S. or he's supporting this troop in, in Kandahar. Okay, let's get into some discussion here about what now, because Barbara's quite right. Uh, the Prime Minister in recent weeks has been, uh, at least in terms of tone anyway, saying different things about Afghanistan than he had said in the past. Now he is, in fact, saying the mission can't go beyond February of 2009 if the majority of the members of the House of Commons vote against it, because after all, he heads a, a minority government. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, get us started here. Given all of what we know right now, given the disproportionate burden that Canada is bearing right now. Should Canadian troops stay in Afghanistan past Feb 09, which is the current end of mission? In my view, yes. Because if we fail to do that, then we will have thrown the mission away. But that doesn't mean that Canada's role can be, that it can't be changed somewhat. And certainly what is going on right now is the creation of the operational liaison and uh, <coughs> support teams, sometimes referred to as the omelet, 
which is placing Canadian leadership elements, officers and senior warrant officers and sergeants, into one of these Kandaks or light infantry battalions of the Afghan National Army to give them the support, the mentoring in terms of how to put a battalion together and how it works in the field. And I think we will see more and more of that taking place as the security situation becomes somewhat better uh, in terms of the ability of the Afghan National Army to handle things. So I see an evolution in the Canadian role which will involve less direct combat and more developing the capacity of the Afghan National Army. Steve Staples, February 09. What should Canada be doing after that? Well, I, th I think that this, this combat mission uh, is going to end. Uh, I think the Prime Minister, uh, you know, he's kept his game face all the way through the last parliamentary session, and then within a few days after Parliament rose, he said, well, uh, you know, it's pretty much going to end in 2009 unless I can get a, quote, consensus from the opposition parties to carry on beyond that. Well, what uh, we've done is a little bit of thinking about what that uh, consensus might look like. And if you look at what the opposition parties have been saying, certainly the, the combat role in the South would have to end. That would mean the battle group there, I think, would have to move. But there could be some possibilities for a return to the kind of role that we did in Kabul for many years, which was a peace support role in the North. Some troops could stay there. And you could even possibly see the provincial reconstruction team, which is the second element of our engagement in Kandahar, stay on to continue to do some training of Afghan uh, security forces. But can I, I get you to can I get you on. to speak to what Colonel McDonald just said, which is that if we if we do bug out, maybe not the best choice of words, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. If we do bug out after Feb 09, and we don't stay as he suggests we should, we will have given up quote unquote whatever gains we have made in the time that we've been there. What's your view on that? Uh, well, I think we've been losing gains already. For the last year, I think our, our negotiating position in this uh, has been weakening. I think we probably hit a high point last summer with, with, the, with the mission into Panjwe, and it's been slowly receding uh, ever since. And that's why you see a, an emboldened uh, Taliban. So I think part of that decision to end our mission in 2009 along with that must be support for a diplomatic process because really every month that we continue on fighting a counterinsurgency war there I think our negotiating position weakens so we should start right away planning for that uh, uh, handover to the Afghan government in February 2009. Barbara, what's your view on that? Look, let's talk real politic here. We are going to be out of that combat mission in February 2009, count on it. No because, question in your mind, eh? No, because Stephen Harper has a minority government and all the other opposition parties are against the continuation. Either they're going to be out of there or we're going to have an election on this issue. It comes down to that. Jeff Kopstein? You know, sometimes in politics there are only bad decisions, and this, this really appears to be one of those cases. I mean, clearly, if we pull out and nobody takes our place, nobody takes our place in the South, that's handing the South back to the Taliban. That's the reality of the situation. Now, I don't think that would be good for Afghanistan. I don't think that would be good for the rest of the world. But Barbara may be right that this government may not have the ability to, to withstand the opposition to, opposition to the operation. Whether that's good for the rest of the world, I don't know. Well, there is another option here, which is, okay, maybe they have a vote in, towards February 09. Right. Maybe the government is brought down. Maybe we go to the polls. Maybe Harper wins a majority government, and we're still there. A ab <laughs> absolutely, and that could happen. Or alternatively, another alternative <laughs> is that the country is handed back to the Taliban. They prostitute themselves out again to al-Qaeda. And once that's seen to be dangerous enough, we bomb the country again. Right? That is also a possibility, right? thinking two or three steps down the line, a little bit beyond Canada, I realize. Almas, uh, give me 30 seconds on this, because I've got one good question at the end I want to save. So you tell me, February 09, what should we be doing? I think Canada should stay until the job is done. And, and as Afghan, we appreciate uh, what Canada or other international community is doing in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, for Canada to pull out of Kandahar, uh, I don't think uh, that would be a reasonable uh, move because now Canadian soldiers, Canadian troops in Kandahar, uh, they know the area, they know the province, they have uh, made some connection, they have made uh, some progress, and to pull out from Kandahar and move to another province, uh, they have to start from the scratch. Uh, what Prime Minister Harper needs is to reconsider some policies, like counter-narcotic policy and development policies uh, for, uh, for southern Afghanistan. This last question I'm going to put to you, Jeff Kopstein, because a, a supporter of the war needs to ask it. Now, if I only got a minute left, oh, so I'm sorry to do this to you, but Michael Byers said earlier in the program that our investment in Afghanistan 
uh, he, which he disagrees with, has cost us an ability to be more effective in other parts of the world where he thinks we could be doing more and better, namely, say, Darfur. What's your opinion? Well, it's, it's, specu it's speculative. Of course, there are always trade-offs at work. In so far, he's correct. However, we're doing important work in Afghanistan. I agree with the other guests that we should stay until the job is done. If others are not willing to pull up their socks and help us on this, we may have to pull up our socks a bit more. Of course, Canada is a small country. We may eventually need to pull out. If that does happen, the Taliban could come back to power again, and Lord help us all. Okay, you get the last word on this program. Uh, let's th thank our guests for being here today. Barbara Yaffe in Vancouver, B.C., thanks so much for being there on the line. It's good okay. to see you again. Almas Bawar and Steve Staples in Ottawa, great having you on the program today. Thank you. And Colonel Brian McDonald, Jeffrey Kopstein, uh, great to have you alongside as well. Thanks so much, everybody.